This is KGW News at Noon. We start this afternoon with an update to a story that began six months ago. Police have arrested the man they say is responsible for a shooting in Northwest Portland last September that killed one person and left two others injured. Police also say the suspected shooter actually fired two guns into Silver Dollar Pizza on Northwest 21st Avenue and then kept firing shots as he ran away. Catherine Cook had a chance to talk to Silver Dollar's owner. Thank God, justice, justice has finally came. Thank you, thank, thank God. Thank Overwhelming relief for Sam McBail, owner of Silver Dollar Pizza Company on Northwest 21st in Gleason. He just learned police made an arrest in the September murder of 34-year-old Jacob Knight Vasquez. I hope that he would be in jail for a long, long, long time. Police say around 2 a.m., Vasquez walked into the Silver Dollar to meet some friends for a drink. He worked as a server at the tavern right across the street. Suddenly, police say someone outside the Silver Dollar walked by, a gun in each hand, and fired multiple rounds into the restaurant. Vasquez was killed. Two others were hurt. He was literally walked inside in front of him by one second. Had he was delayed one second, he would have been still alive. On Monday, U.S. Marshals arrested 25-year-old Marshawn Edwards in Fairview. Police say Vasquez was not Edwards' intended target, but they think he knows one of the other victims. Last fall, Vasquez's family pleaded with the public for help. My brother was full of life, love. Everyone who knew him in this neighborhood loved him. Court documents show investigators used forensic evidence to tie Edwards to the case. They matched DNA from cartridge casings found on scene with DNA from a 2014 rape kit. In that case, a juvenile victim reported Edwards and another man forced her into having sex. But Edwards and the second man said it was consensual and charges were never filed. Police say security video also helped in this case. It showed the silver dollar shooter wearing what appears to be the same hat and jacket the detective saw Edwards wearing during surveillance. Video from a different shooting last month also shows the gunman wearing that same hat and jacket. Plus, bullet casings found at both shooting scenes matched. A six-month-long investigation Sam McPhail is grateful for. Thank God they have the knowledge, and uh, I hope I was helpful in providing all the videotapes that we have so we could catch uh, this murder. In Northwest Portland, Catherine Cook, KGW News. Well, Portland police have also linked another man to six other shootings that happened in the city this year. Three of the people involved in those shootings wound up dying. Joseph Banks pleaded not guilty in court yesterday. He has a long criminal history, including a dozen felony convictions. Banks also reportedly suffers from schizophrenia and has spent most of the past decade in federal custody. He now faces a total of 15 new charges. Major League Soccer, meanwhile, has fined the Portland Timbers $25,000 for the way they handled domestic violence accusations against former player Andy Polo. The club failed to report the accusations when they found out about them last year, and it wasn't until last month that the Timbers cut ties with Polo after his estranged wife went on TV and detailed the alleged abuse. She also accused the Timbers of trying to pressure her to not file criminal charges, but the league's independent investigation found that the Timbers did not do that. Well, back during the first year of the pandemic, Governor Kate Brown signed off on the early release of hundreds of Oregon inmates. Now there's a new report that shows what happened to those inmates. The report tracked 266 people altogether who were all released back in 2020. 18% of them were rearrested at some point, but mostly for smaller crimes that weren't against other people. 2% of them, though, did wind up going back to prison. Experts say these reoffender rates are actually slightly lower than the year before. So we spoke with the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission and asked specifically about inmates getting let out early. Hearing about inmates being released for whatever reason probably doesn't sit well with some people. Maybe what would your message be having looked at the factors underneath all of this? Especially in an era where we have seen some upticks in crime rates, especially in some of our major cities in the state, is that it's very unlikely that the commutations uh, contributed to, to those types of dynamics that we're seeing um, outside right now. 
The Department of Corrections says when it comes to releasing an inmate early, it has to first determine if that person will have housing and access to any needed medical care. Because without those things, people are much more likely to fall back on hard times and potentially repeat their crimes. Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty will have to pay more than $16,000 to Bank of America because of overdue debt and fees. According to the Oregonian, a judge made that ruling after Hardesty didn't show up in court. Hardesty told us late last year that she started building up credit card debt when she ran for city council back in 2018. She also told us that she tried to work out a payment plan. Hardesty told the Oregonian that she does plan to pay the debt, but she did not explain why she wasn't in court. Well, Beaverton has a new form of government, and that's one of the things Beaverton's mayor highlighted yesterday during her annual State of the City address. It's also worth mentioning she delivered that address on a scooter. Pat Doris has more. Usually these things are pretty dull. A mayor will stand at a podium and drone on and on and on about their accomplishments to a room full of people who really work hard to try and stay awake. This one was not that. Hey, Mayor, we're ready for you. All right, I'm on my way. That was a mayor. Yeah, no kidding. I like the scooter. This was Beaverton's new mayor, Lacey Beatty. She's been in office for about a year now. And instead of delivering a stuffy speech, she created a video and took viewers on a scooter driven odyssey through town. We want to focus on one recent change that Beaverton has made that Portland could vote on in November, changing the government structure. They used to have something called a strong mayor where the mayor ran the city administratively, but voters approved a change. And on January 1st of 2021, Beaverton got a professional city manager. They also went from five council members to seven, including the mayor. Councilors say restructuring the government helps them get things done more efficiently. We changed from the strong mayor form of government, of which Beaverton was the only example in the state of Oregon, to a council manager form of government, which every other city in Oregon except Portland has. And in that form of government, we have a professional city manager who's responsible for managing the, the staff, the programs, the finances, and the assets of the city. And we have a full-time mayor who, by the way, votes at the council, who gets to be the ambassador to the, the community. They say the mayor has been able to use that ambassador role to bring in a lot of money from the state and federal government that can be invested in the city, while the city manager takes care of the day-to-day -day operations. We're going to be looking into those changes in the next few weeks, so we want to hear from you, especially if you live or work in Beaverton. Contact us. Let us know what's working well and what really needs to change. Send us an email at thestory at kgw.com or leave us a voicemail, 503-226-5090. All right, that was Pat Doris reporting for us. Before we check in with Rod Hill and the Weather Center, we want to take a look at this surveillance video. This shows the moments before an EF3 tornado tore through a North Texas school last week. Now you can see the school's principal in one of those shots as he leaves through a hallway just seconds. There you see it just seconds before the storm tears the hallway apart. The principal did make it out OK. Two schools altogether were badly damaged in that storm. We see these other camera shots that show the tornado blasting through the walls of a couple of gyms that also tore up a football field. So crews are still working to repair parts of those schools and remove the debris. Nobody was hurt, though, and students were already able to go back to class there yesterday, which is pretty amazing, Rod Hill. Uh, we were talking earlier about that video. It's just you don't really usually see that, you know, inside the middle of the storm as it hits. And we were also talking about those EF3 tornado winds, like how strong they were exactly. Yeah. Uh, something we had some fun with this morning to some degree <laughs> on our Sunrise Show. Our dear friend Brenda asked me, Rod, how fast are those EF3 wind speeds? I should have that like that, right? And I just blanked. I couldn't come up with it. So. As soon as she asked the question, I saw in your eyes, he doesn't know. <laughs> I wrote it down this time, so I couldn't miss the answer, the quiz, right? So what we typically get real quick here in the Northwest are either EF or EF zeros, and occasionally we'll get an EF one. So EF zero, 65 to 85 mile per hour winds. I mean, you can get, you know, a really strong thunderstorm gust at least hitting 60, 65, right? EF ones occasionally in the Northwest, 86 to one, two. And then you jump down to what that storm was believed to have winds around the vortex of the funnel between 136 
and 165 mile per winds and EF4 of course you hit one 200 and then if you go to EF5 you go over 200 and that really really gets catastrophic. I want to back up real quick to Monday afternoon. If you go back to Monday uh, that was that big low that was down in California and it was shooting instability up in our area. We had quite a few thunderstorms reported in central and eastern Oregon, a few lightning strikes along the Cascades. And then here in the valley, we caught this. Jamie uh, cut this funnel. This was uh, 445 in the afternoon between Sublimity and Almsville. No reports that that touched down. No reports of any strong wind, but evidence of how unstable we were. Again, that was back on Monday. Scattered showers continuing at this hour. There's not a lot of rain and most of the shower activity around Portland, Salem and Battleground continues to be light. We are seeing snow flurries up at Timberline Lodge. A little bit of sun at times. That's Cathedral Ridge Winery out in uh, the gorge and then downtown Portland. We're at 53. We keep the scattered shower chance alive this afternoon. Temperatures generally will hold in the 50s. Drew?